This is Transparency, a podcast by Gender Dysphoria Alliance, hosted by Aaron Kimberly and Aaron Tarrell. Each week we'll be joined by people who have personal or professional experience with gender dysphoria and physical transition. We'll also discuss how our trans experiences relate to the concept of gender identity. Join us for a compassionate yet heterodox approach to the question of trans. All right, welcome back to another episode of Transparency. Everybody, we are joined um, by um, Dr. Michael Bailey. He is a professor of psychology at Northwestern University, uh, much more famously, though, the author of The Man Who Would Be Queen, which kind of uh, skyrocketed Blanchard's uh, to typology. Uh, male to female uh, orientation, or excuse me, transition, uh, to kind of uh, popular, the, the popular cultural consciousness. Uh, and obviously there was a lot of uh, resulting backlash uh, uh, from that. Um, but anyway, we'll get into um, all of the above and then, and then some, but uh, if you want to take it away and introduce yourself from here. So uh, you did a good job. I'm Michael Bailey. I'm uh, a professor of psychology at Northwestern University since uh, uh, I was hired here in 1989, and uh, I initially started studying sexual orientation, and that's been my predominant uh, uh, focus. But you know, um, sexual orientation turns out is uh, very interrelated with uh, gender dysphoria and gender identity, uh, and that that. Uh, association motivated my uh, writing my book, uh, which was published in 2003, The Man Who Would Be Queen, and I'm going to provide you with a link where your uh, viewers and listeners uh, can download that book for free, and they should, and they should read it and give it to their children and grandparents. Uh, and uh, now I'm... Uh, you know, sexual orientation, what that means has uh, broadened, and, and I think for the most part correctly, to include uh, atypical sexual orientations, uh, you know, including paraphilias, most relevantly for us, autogynephilia, but also pedophilia and things like that, and I'm happy to talk about those things as well. Excellent, excellent, all right. Well, yeah, thank you very much for being here. I, one thing that I- um... so, Yeah, I just wanna say it's a pleasure. I think that you all are uh, both in listening to you and in my communications with you, you're exceptionally well-informed and thoughtful on this. And that's what we really need more of, you are, you know, you're, you're scholars of this, uh, and that, that's what we need. We, we need scholars, not ideologues. Well, th thank you very much. And yeah, yeah. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with, yeah, we need, uh, kind of dispassion, uh, approaches to, to all of this, if we're gonna, uh, get anywhere. Um, I, I'm really, I, enjoy your work in that you you kind of you you not only do you explore the the transgender issue um or the, the gender dysphoria issue but also the uh sexual orientation issue in a way that a lot of people seem to talk about as if we just know what what you know homosexuality is and we know what heterosexuality is and let's put all that to bed and talk about the uh gender dysphoria stuff now well even that's controversial we're not really supposed to be doing that either but i still think there's a lot to explore with regards to sexual orientation and and how that plays out in the in the gender discourse and it, there's there seems to be kind of like you talk about we talk about gay and straight or homosexuality as if it is just one thing in a way that people now talk about transgenderism like it is just one thing and i obviously take issue with talking about transgenderism as if it's one thing but also uh, I, I think there's just a lot more nuance to the concept and the um, the experience of homosexuality uh, than than we than we allow to be discussed nowadays. Well, um, just to clarify, I believe both of you, and I hope and expect you will not object to my terminology. You are both natal females. Is this true? Correct. Uh, 
Yes. yes. And uh, I uh, believe that uh, sexual orientation and what it means uh, varies uh, according to natal sex. Uh, and it's, I think it's very simple for natal males uh, and in general, uh, sexual orientation for natal males is a, an extremely strong arousal dependent focus on a particular, it's usually, you know, a particular kind of person, a man or a woman, and then you get in these unusual uh, variations like child, you know, a, a, a prepubescent male child and, and so on. But for the most part, it's an adult man or an adult woman. And, you know, there's a, a smaller percentage of people uh, who are attracted to both for natal males. Um, and, you know, we are, uh, it's a very rigid and strong preference and <clears throat> we don't switch much and, you know, it, the alternatives don't work for us uh, for the most part. And uh, for natal females, uh, it's somewhat different. And, uh, you know, the, the most striking difference uh, is illustrated by our uh, research in, in lab experiments. Uh, if we bring men into the lab and we show them, uh, let's say, uh, very explicit videos either featuring two men having sex with each other or two women having sex with each other. Uh, and we measure their response by, uh, we can either ask them, how, how was that for you? Or we can also measure their uh, genital response, their erections. Uh, their response pretty much lines up perfectly uh, with what they say they are. And furthermore, when it uh, deviates, uh, when, when a man says, you know, I'm, I'm straight, I, I like women, but he's getting strong erections to the male stimuli, if we follow up, he'll usually, you know, say, yeah, well, okay, yeah, okay, I like men, you know. Uh, that is uh, extremely different than what we find for natal females. Uh, so uh, natal females who have not transitioned, um, they, so uh, those who say they're straight, they in the lab, and we, so we can measure genital response in females. It's obviously not uh, exactly the same as a, an erection. And uh, basically we measure their blood flow to the vagina which is the objective measure. Uh, and we also ask them, either way, straight women are pretty much indifferent between viewing the two males and the two females. Uh, lesbians, homosexual women, do show a bias toward the uh, two women, but it's not as much as uh, for two men. Uh, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'll uh, pause and let you talk. Uh, so you, one might ask, well, two males versus two females, you know, where, most sex is between a man and a woman, you know, what, where are they? You know, if we show videos of a man and a woman and somebody gets aroused, you don't know why. Is it because they're looking at the man or the woman? Uh, so uh, it's the same-sex configurations that are most informative. Okay, I pause. Just actually curious on that note, um, with a lot of people, uh, you know, all, do have an, inna an innate form of homophobia, where it's kind of averse to images of same-sex sexual interaction. Does that not come into this at all? Is that is that not a consideration? You know, if like somebody's just kind of repulsed by either watching two men or two women, that's going to diminish the sexual response, right? 
Okay, a couple of things. First, uh, to what extent is this repulsion innate versus learn? Uh, I am increasingly of the mind that it is not innate. There are cultures where it's pretty common for, uh, let's say, natal males to have sex with each other. So I, uh, my friend Paul Basie, who's a, uh, a very, who does fascinating research in Samoa, where there are, um, Fafafine are, uh, uh, they are natal males who identify as quasi-females. They don't say that we're women like they might in the West. They, fafafine means in the manner of a woman. They know they're not women, but they're kind of, you know, they, they will get a, often adopt a female name and grow their hair long and wear female dress and so on, but they have, uh, they re, uh, retain their penises and uh, they know they're not women. <laughs> but uh, most Samoan men, straight men, sometime have sex with a fafafina during their lives. And, uh, you know, this happens a lot. So I don't think it's so much, and, and this has been studied in other cultures too. I, I think uh, there, there's a sociologist uh, who's, uh, who, who has died, Fred Whittem. He's an important sociologist. He did some really cool work uh, cross-culturally. He, uh, said, and it makes sense to me, that one of the most cross-culturally variable phenomena is the reaction of men to the idea of having sex with other males. And some cultures, it happens a lot. You know, even in the West, let's say uh, 100, 150 years ago, uh, there's reason to think that, you know, lots of straight men would, you know, so women were much, women were hard to get. <laughs> and, you know, but they, they didn't, uh, you know. On the railroad and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, well, and they, you know, maybe there was more sexual conservatism and, and, mm -hmm. and, and females, you know, married later back then. And, you know, men, you know, availed themselves of feminine, typically feminine men who now we might call gay men, but uh, then they might have been called something else. Uh, but they were androphilic. They were attracted to men. And um, yeah. So and you do see that kind of, you know, like it's in boarding schools or more darkly in prisons, you know, where, you know, the absence of, you know, a female company, but that, that does actually, doesn't that kind of contradict what you were saying before that like, um, and I'm just throwing like, not actually saying that, but like, um, you know, with, with males having these really strong sexual orientations mm -hmm. that aren't malleable in the same way that female sexual orientation is. But you're basically saying the opposite is that is that men are quite likely to sleep with each other in the absence of an alternative. Yeah, you're uh, good. Good point. And I, um, I guess I interpret that um, as follows: that the so the straight men would be preferring natal males who are very feminine and uh in their presentation and so on and they uh, would probably be preferring uh sexual interactions in which they would be penetrating uh either anally or orally uh a natal male and and not restrict reciprocating at any level right and probably yeah. thinking of this person as a mm -hmm. female i mean I, you know i would i would you know kind of can't really go back there and interview these people but my guess would be that they would be fantasizing uh about a woman and that these natal males the way that their presentation would make that easy 
for them. I wonder too, in the studies comparing um, the, the female sexual response and the male sexual response, if, if one of the factors could be the, just the response to visual stimuli in general, um, do you think men are, are more likely to be, um, to be aroused due to visual stimuli in ways that women might not be? I absolutely think that that's true, that males are more responsive to um, explicit sexual stimuli, in, uh, you know, especially visual stimuli. And I think evolutionarily that makes sense. You know, we wouldn't expect that women would have evolved to be very aroused by seeing, let's say, a naked man. That that wouldn't be uh, evolutionarily adaptive for them, you know, because, you know, we, evolutionary you know women get pregnant they have a lot to lose if they get pregnant uh, by somebody who doesn't help them raise a, a child and so on uh, yeah so I do think that that's true uh, on the one hand you know on the other hand and, and actually that is my explanation for uh, why for I guess for, for the sex difference um, that uh, for males, it is, we males evolved to be very aroused by um, signals of sexual opportunity with, you know, somebody they could make babies with. And obviously, uh, you know, seeing somebody unclothed or or engaged in sexual interactions, that that would be what they would look for. Females didn't evolve that way. Uh, so, you know, how did females evolve? What what is sexual orientation for natal females? I think that's a question that we haven't really answered very well yet. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I, I think that there's evidence, strong evidence to suggest it's very different than it is for NATO males. And, you know, yeah. um, I also, I also think, um, to bring in something relevant to your podcast and, and you can tell me whether you agree with this, uh, so transsexuals male to female transsexuals who are uh androphilic the ones who are um who are very feminine boys and like men and so on after they transition they stay that way they they have no interest in uh, women oh, except as friends they, they're uh, mm -hmm. like that uh, whereas um, I have heard several uh, cases, uh, including friends of friends and so on, where a, a female to male transsexual who would have thought, you know, this is a butch lesbian becoming a, a man and so on. But after transition, some of them, you know, got into having sex with men. You know, uh, and if if anybody should should have been, if any natal female should have been rigid uh, uh, in their sexuality, um, I would have thought it would have been them. But even they seem more flexible than the natal male counterpoint. But does that have to do with, it probably has a lot to do with just the fact that female sexuality does tend to be, seem to be much more malleable, but also the fact that if you're, you know, inundating a male with, um, you know, exogenous estrogen, that's not going to alter their sexual orientation. Estrogen doesn't really have that effect, right? But whereas you put male levels of testosterone into a female, you know, testosterone is, is quite the sexual motivator. And so I, I think, you know, do we know how much of that is the fact that this is a natal female and therefore sexually malleable or the fact that this is a, um, you know, this is testosterone that's that's flooded this person's system and therefore um, that that's going to, uh, that could have more of an impact on altering, um, you know, sexuality. I mean, like, like you were saying about, um, you know, you know, 
males obviously are much more uh, visually stimulated, uh, you know, are sexually stimulated by visual. Like I was never visual. I never had any sexual stimulation to visuals until testosterone, and then that became a very prominent thing. And so I think I don't know how much of it is is you know, again, like the the alterability of, of female sexuality, or it is the testosterone that's doing it. Well, you raise interesting points, uh, and. So I, but I, still, I don't know why a natal female who uh, undergoes hormonal treatment with testosterone, why that would not just intensify that person's yeah. uh, attraction to females rather than make them less discriminating. Also remember, uh, uh, male to female transsexuals often have uh, estrogen uh, therapy, which uh, counteracts, counteracts their testosterone. And yet uh, the endophilic types never say, oh, you know, males, females, no difference. They, they, they really retain that uh, reference. I wonder how much of that is is relational or and if if it makes any difference when like as you say like if it was a butch lesbian who had been part of the lesbian community for quite some time as opposed to maybe a, an adolescent who transitions at a much younger age and hasn't developed a lesbian identity yet how much of that is um lesbians becoming trans men and then realizing but relationally i feel like i have more in common with gay men i don't want to leave the gay and lesbian community and be perceived as as heterosexual could i sleep with with gay men and still be a part of the gay and lesbian community well um maybe but i i would say that you're raising this just demonstrates the difference between male and female sexuality because I really I think for with men it's like what kind of body does this person have that that's what matters to me whereas once you start raising relational aspects that's really not a very male typical thing and it's interesting too because it seems that that transitioning seems to have everything to do with with sexual orientation for the male transitioners, you know, be it be it um, autogynephilia or the um, uh, HSTS variety, it seems that that sexual orientation is a, is a primary motivator. Whereas that really doesn't come into play, even with, with female transitioners, even with the the uber butches. It, um, I mean, there, there's certainly a sexual element to it, um, but it, it doesn't. I've I've never, except in like uh, a, a a recent episode where I did with um, uh, a detransitioner who was autoandrophilic and uh, her transition was very sexually motivated. Um, but I think that type is very few and far between uh, with when it comes to, to female transitioners. It seems much more socially motivated um, than yeah. sexually motivated. So I, I uh, my, my uh, research and my um, experience talking to real people has been 98 percent with natal males and uh i i'm you know i i know some of the literature on natal females and and so on uh and i've begun to study so as as we know there's a new type of uh, gender dysphoria and transition uh, you know, adolescent onset uh, that I think is probably quite different uh, in its motivations and phenomenology than kind of, you know, that, then let's say um, female to male uh, transsexualism of uh, 20 years ago and earlier. Uh, so, I, I just want to say um, I, I, I'm hesitant to uh, say anything other than speculative about this because I, you know, I, I don't, 
you know, I've, I've published uh, one study of female to male uh, uh, transsexualism and comparing those who are androphilic versus not. And I met like a couple in person, but I just, I don't have great confidence that I understand uh, female to male transitioners, whereas for male to female, I'm pretty, pretty confident. Until recently, though, right? Like, because I think because the Raj did the, the rapid onset gender dysphoria phenomenon doesn't only impact girls now. It seems to be there's a there's a growing number of boys swept up in it uh, as well. And do you think that those kind of fall in that same kind of two type dichotomy that was easily observable in the past? So th there's a lot of um, there's a lot of interest and some controversy regarding whether uh, ROGD. Uh, uh, applies to males the same way that it does to females. And, uh, you know, I, I've had some uh, parents in the, uh, you know, transition skeptical world uh, kind of insist that the, uh, that ROGD is a thing for males. And I, so I, I think that um, I, I'll, I'll say two things. One, uh, it depends what you mean. And second of all, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to know. So let me get more specific. Uh, in terms of it's hard to know, uh, we, we know that uh, autogynephilia onsets typically in adolescence, uh, and the most common uh, expression of autogynephilia is a natal male who uh, discovers, you know, early in adolescence that it really turns him on to put on uh, female lingerie, look at himself in the mirror by himself and masturbate, uh, you know, looking like a woman, at least dressing like a woman. That's, you know, 90% of autogynephilia begins that way. And uh, a subset of autogynephilia uh, progresses to gender dysphoria for reasons that are not that well understood. Um, now, do we think that parents of sons who are doing this know that their sons are doing this? Do we think that parents know that their sons are having fantasies about having vulvas and breasts and so on? I do not think that that is very common. Um, so that said, we are in a period where it's cool to be trans you get points. And also there's this massive online ideology that I think pushes uh, people toward transition. And I think that those influences actually further uh, rapid onset in whoever. Uh, so, and, and, and including uh, uh, males with autogynephilia. So, I, I think that given an autogynephilic male, um, what he encounters online is going to influence what he thinks he should do. And I think that that can push uh, toward something that looks like ROGD. But I, I think that uh, a big difference between uh, autogynephilic ROGD-like phenomena and what we're seeing with natal females is that, you know, autogynephilia is a very powerful motivator. Uh, uh, and, you know, it, it uh, is 
it is a sexual orientation and uh, we can kind of understand why that uh, why somebody with that given the right kinds of influences uh, might try to transition and uh, also you know to their parents it's going to look like ROGD because they they didn't ever talk to their parents about their feelings and so on. They, they're like on uh, websites and so on. And, and finally they decide and they say, uh, uh, mom, dad, you know, I'm trans. And that, that their parents gonna experience that as being rapid onset, where it's, it's less rapid for that natal male. Uh, so for natal females, with ROGD, and again, we don't know this. I'm not saying we know this, and I, I think that uh, we should, everybody on both sides, all sides of the controversy should uh, be more, should, they should acknowledge more what we don't know, which is a lot. Uh, I, I, I uh, at least the hypothesis that I find very plausible is that uh, for natal females, it's not really about sexual orientation. For the most part, it's not about uh, clear atypical gender dysphoria. It's about uh, these cultural influences and ideas and thinking that your problems are likely due to trans. Uh, and then accepting that. And I think that's very different than for uh, autogynephilic males. Yeah, the needle males and needle females seem so completely different in terms of just the developmental pathway to leading up to the point of them wanting hormones and surgeries that I, I, I'm leaning towards the idea of there being almost two completely separate treatment streams or, or at least clinicians who really understand the differences between how natal males and natal females are going to present and what their different motivations are going to be. Yeah, and, and um, another thing that I've uh, kind of run up against some parents about, and, and that is um, what should autogynephilic males do? And uh, for some people, the idea that they have this weird sexuality, which is, it turns them on to imagine themselves as female. So obviously they shouldn't get a sex change. Well, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> you know, I, I, if it makes them happy and if the alternative is gonna make them less happy and furthermore, you know, say hi to your dog for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know what, what's what's their alternative going to be? An autogynephilic male? Uh, they're going to be um, they're going to have this their whole life, uh, and you know some can be happy getting married, typically to a, a natal female, a woman, and uh, uh, but but some are going to be less happy. And I, I don't know why they should uh, not progress and and get uh, and transition. The one thing that I will uh, insist on, at least until it's disproven, is that it's better that they should uh, be informed about autogynephilia and the likelihood that their uh, their own gender dysphoria is related to that, then that they should believe in uh, fairy tales. That seems to be a big problem is, is you know, they, they buy into the gender ideology stuff, but the reason they feel this way, the reason they have gender euphoria is because they're really women on the inside. And therefore, if they proceed with the transition, you know, that's what they should do. Not understanding that that the motivation is entirely uh, sexual. And then, then they have, you know, this is, this is you know, obviously, you know, there, there are, there are, because autogynephilia is progressive, right? So typically, you know, it's going to get worse and worse throughout the course of, of their lifetime. And if they understand where the motivation is coming from, I can understand how a full transition could be 
could alleviate that dis- that discomfort or that that gender dysphoria, but when it's a young man doing it without knowing where that motivation is coming from, you see a lot of these posts on you know detransition Reddit and whatnot is basically like as soon as they have this orchiectomy, it's like the whole illusion comes crumbling down around them, and it's like what have I just done? Um, and we're, we're seeing quite a lot of that now with because it's propagated by gender ideology. So. You, you said that autogynephilia is progressive and gets worse and worse. I don't think we know that, uh, though I, I think it's plausible that that's true. And we, we desperately need uh, longitudinal data. And my uh, ex-student, uh, and now he's a, a professor, assistant professor at Penn State Abington, uh, Kevin Sue, uh, and uh, James Morandini from Australia are collaborating on a a uh, longitudinal study of uh, gender dysphoric males that will include a lot of anaphilic uh, males uh, to look at, you know, different progressions and what works for them. You know, I, I know um, I know of uh, autogynephilic males who've gone to the precipice and turned back, and, and I know some who've transitioned. I know some who, uh, for whom it was very intense early on and uh, it relaxed. You know, I, I think that we, we need to be careful because uh, the ones that we uh, are most familiar with are, are, you know, are the ones, you know, like, uh, you know, so I'm just going to name people and, you know, you can, you can decide whether to cut this out or not. You know, Caitlyn Jenner and, uh, uh, Oh gosh, there are some people who threaten me if I uh, name them as autogynephilic, so I won't. Uh, but we we know of people who've um, gone there, so there's a selection effect. So w- what we don't know of people who <laughs> the, the people who've considered getting sex changes and decided not, we're we're less familiar with because. You know, they're they're less famous. Um, so anyway, I, the the course of autogynephilia is uh, not well known, uh, and it's very important that we uh, learn more. And I and I I think you know, autogynephilia has been until recently. The mo- in the West, it's been the most common reason for sex reassignment surgery, uh, and it's uh, an outrage and a tragedy that we don't know more about it. And the entire reason is because uh, a subset of autogynephiles have uh, made it gone berserk, like what they did to you. That's yeah. right, and and you know I I do want to emphasize that um, many, many autogynophiles, I got more uh, emails from autogynophiles thanking me for my book and for helping them to understand themselves and bringing it out in the open than I got uh, hateful emails. I did get quite a few hateful, hateful emails, so, it, you know, it's, it's not... Uh, one definitely is at risk for uh, uh, talking about autogynephilia. Uh, but, you know, I, and I want to congratulate you in this podcast for talking about it so openly. Uh, and there, there are public intellectuals uh, who should be talking about it who aren't. Uh, nobody, nobody should be talking and writing about trans stuff unless they're willing to mention the A word. Mm-hmm. It, it's a big part of it. I'm curious if you got any feedback, either positive or negative, from the homosexual transsexuals. The, the homosexual transsexual, so um, I, I uh, knew uh, homosexual transsexuals 20 years ago while I was writing my book. Um, and 
due to fallout and so on. I really don't know any anymore. Uh, and it's not like they really got mad at me for anything that I wrote. They were influenced. Uh, there, there are these, uh, there were, and I suspect there still are, these uh, correlations between type of male to female transsexualism and things like social class and 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 uh, occupation and so on. Uh, but back then, anyway, the homosexual transsexuals really didn't care much about the whole gender world. They they did not spend much time on uh, listservs or or chat rooms or whatever we had talking about the nature of gender identity. They just wanted to have a good time <laughs> and lead a good life. And you know, for them, they they, they uh, and the, so this is something that made a lot of people mad that I wrote about in my book. Uh, but I don't think it made, uh, for the most part, uh, the homosexual transsexuals mad. Uh, uh, they are very sexually motivated. Uh, you know, the, the, if you, and I'm sure you have uh, known, met, homosexual male to female transsexuals, they are often extraordinarily feminine in their presentation. Uh, however, uh, those that I know most about uh, were very masculine with respect to their approach to sexuality and especially casual sex and so on. They had lots of sex partners. One of them I wrote about in my book, uh, you know, she actually found her uh, alleged ideal. She found a guy who uh, married her, I, I was at their wedding, and so on. Uh, but she got bored uh, and, you know, started turning tricks again. Uh, and, you know, I don't know what she's doing now. But uh, I, I think that, that, I think, and I think that's very interesting uh, with respect to basic science. I think that uh, uh, whatever causes... Um, gay men and androphilic male to female transsexuals to be feminine in certain ways, including uh, aspects of their gender identity, does not really touch their uh, interest in casual sex, which remains male typical. And, you know, I, I also think uh, the opposite is true. I think that. Um, so I, I, again, even though I've studied uh, female to male transsexuals, and this is in the paper, and I don't even remember what we found, uh, so I won't talk about that. But I know that in studies of uh, lesbians, you know, so lesbians, uh, we found evidence that there's that they are psychologically masculinized. Here's one uh, instance. Uh, lesbians are much more interested than straight women in looking at porn, which is a male thing, right? But they're not, at least in our study, they were not at all more interested in having casual sex than straight women. They were, you know, kind of like that. Uh, and both much less interested than either straight or gay men. And it's interesting, too, because it seems like, uh, you know, lesbian women are more likely to have kind of male typical professions. And then the same with, uh, uh, you know, effeminate gay men or, or male to female uh, HSTS transitioners mm -hmm. uh, more likely to have, you know, fem feminine type uh, occupations. And yet in both instances, even though like there's some sort of, you know, certainly a case to be made about masculinization or feminization of the brain, the, 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 the sexual behavior maintains stays stays typical to their natal step natal sex yeah absolutely and uh, you know and what you just said uh is i think uh uh interesting and and so th there's not a there's not a, a masculinization or feminization of the entire brain that goes together different parts of the brain and mind can be 
masculinized or not independently of each other. And for some reason, uh, sexual orientation does go with things like uh, occupational and recreational interests. That's a, that's a real thing. That's a that's a big effect. You know, uh, gay men really do much more than straight men become hairdressers, professional dancers. Uh, straight men become, you know, uh, mechanics and so on more than more than gay men and and uh, you know that there's uh, these rare cases of uh, surgical, I guess surg surgical trauma in which uh, uh, natal males have been, had their genitals destroyed and have been reared as females uh, and what happens to them. And uh, one of the cases that I always remember, uh, this, so this was again, this was a little boy at age six months uh, during like a circumcision, penis was- Do you David Reimer? This is not Reimer, this is another oh, one. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, out of Canada. Uh, uh, the uh, at follow up, this person still um, identified as female. Her occupation was a truck driver, which is one of the most masculine occupations there is. Anecdotally, you know, in the in the FTM world, I I observed just I heard so many stories of trans men talking about having gynecological problems or, or some reason for why their testosterone levels might be high. I mean, in my case, I had a novo testes. Um, and then I started seeing research to that effect that there seems to be some correlation between high testosterone levels and female to male transsexualism. But I wonder, are you aware of any research about the impact of testosterone on lesbianism? Well, there, so we, we should distinguish uh, two possible time times in which we would expect an effect. There's uh, prenatal testosterone, which is when we think that uh, the brain and even the body, but especially the brain, is organized. Uh, and then uh, postnatal uh, testosterone. And um, I, I believe there have been some studies, you know, it's very hard to study prenatal testosterone and its effect on the, on the brain because, you know, you have to have measures of prenatal testosterone and so on. And I believe there might have been one out of England consistent with that. And I, I you know, I think that I'm skeptical until it, it's demonstrated pretty well. And then there are also some um, uh, studies of adults, uh, and they look at circulating testosterone, uh, which is much easier to do, uh, and and found some uh, correlations. And again, I would have to say uh, I'm a bit skeptical. You you may know that uh, science uh, has uh, been having a problem. Uh, with respect to replicability, and there are various things that scientists have been doing wrong uh, that um, uh, we're only now uh, fixing. And I believe these studies were done before then. I, I don't really know why it would, uh, uh, why uh, circulating testosterone, if it were high, would make somebody attracted to women, if it's lower, attracted to men. And we do know, actually, uh, with respect to uh, natal males, uh, that people have looked at gay men versus straight men, and there's no difference in their circulating testosterone. So it doesn't work for natal males. Why would it work for uh, natal females, even though there is some evidence for natal females? Uh, so. Anyway, I, I think that uh, I, I do, my, my hypothesis, because I am, I strongly believe 
uh, with insufficient evidence so far <laughs> that uh, sexual orientation in both natal males and natal females reflects the sexual differentiation of the brain, which is dependent on early, testo early testosterone, hormonal influence. Um, but, you know, I, I just don't think the evidence is there for that yet. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask about um, comorbidities and how, how common are com comorbidities um, in the, in the um, male to female transsexuals that you had studied? So how common would be something like narcissism, for example, be um, with AGP? I, I, I think that there's a superficial similarity between uh, AGP and what we think of as narcissism and, you know, somebody who's AGP is turned on by the idea of them. So a, a male with AGP is turned on by the idea of himself as a woman. And people will say, well, he's turned on by himself, so he's narcissistic. I think that that is um, misleading. Uh, I, I think that uh, that particular uh, aspect of AGP, uh, that so AGPs, uh, who are turned on by them, the idea of themselves as females often loathe their own masculinity uh, and feel bad about themselves. They're ashamed for being AGP and so on. Uh, so I don't believe that, AG, that narcissism is a thing in general for AGP. Uh, I do think that if you look at the most, um, some of the best known cases that are likely to be AGP, including some who attacked me, they're raging narcissists. Uh, and what's going on is that uh, these are people who, uh, for example, you know, they put their families through a whole lot uh, in order to become women. They uh, reacted against anybody like me who challenged their own preferred narrative because, you know, that's what narcissists do. You know, they, they don't you dare mm -hmm. contradict what I say. Uh, so th that is a, more of a selection effect of the AGPs who've become famous in certain ways. Uh, I don't think that narcissism is an intrinsic correlate of autogynephilia. It's hard for me to relate to the position of not wanting to understand your own self or your own condition. I mean, I, to me, it's it's fascinating, and I want to understand myself, and I would that, want. That's, any... that's why you're <laughs> precious, and and I love you. You know that you are too rare. You 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 know that's that's the problem. You know that we too many people these days don't want to understand. They want to just win. They want, they want their narrative out there. But no, thank you for your, your approach and your attitude. That, that's, that's why I'm here with you, because I deeply respect it. Thank you. I mean, part of it, too, you know, is, is looking at it as a clinician and having young people come to me asking for help. And it, it doesn't, I feel like I would be a stronger clinician to them if I understood something of their experience from an evidence basis. And, and then as a, as a trans person myself, how helpful it might've been, because I transitioned in 2006. So by then queer theory had already completely taken over the healthcare system. <laughs> so there was no conversation about what is gender dysphoria and, and helping to, be un to understand it, which means there's no help along the way. So yes, we got our hormones and our surgeries, but there's no help along the way to navigate the complexities socially as a trans person, be, you know, because if clinicians don't retain their understanding of what gender dysphoria even is, then they can't really be present for us to help us navigate how weird it sometimes gets or how difficult it sometimes gets negotiating who we are with, 
with those around us. So I'm, I'm kind of motivated to do this for two reasons. One is just to better understand myself and, and other trans people. But as, as a clinician too, I think this is really important information for us to retain so that we can adequately support people. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that um, for autogynephilia, there is this intrinsic competition between um, wanting to know, to know what's true because truth is generally a good guide to what one should do and wanting to believe what feels good. And remember, autogynophiles, their deepest desire is to be women. And so telling them, you know, you're, you're a woman, you know, you should become a woman. You're naturally a woman is quite rewarding. Uh, now, that said, uh, had many an autogynophile, you know, write me and said, you know, that, that never, I never believed that. <laughs> I never could believe that. Uh, and your account uh, makes sense to me. Um, again, you know, I, I just, I think it's um, it's malpractice to push the uh, the standard narrative that you were a woman trapped in a man's body on somebody with an autogynephilic history because they they don't have that's not what <laughs> women are like you know uh, you know tell them it's kind of a paradox what, at, the, at the root right you know it's like you know this this feeling that they are women uh, but it, but it, the, the motivation is 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 inherently male um you know root cause mm -hmm. yeah no that's right i you know i i think that uh so my uh my my uh view and i would say it's quite informed i've been studying this for a long time is that uh autogynephilia is a very uh it's an unusual uh sexuality that is uh exclusive to men because uh men maybe only men or almost only men have paraphilias and it's a paraphilia uh and that's you know that's not rewarding <laughs> to uh that's not a rewarding understanding to many autogonophiles but I think it's true. Such a difference in how it plays out in the activism too. I mean, you've definitely been on the, the difficult end of their activism um, as uh, uh, me to a lesser extent, but that dynamic has existed within the trans community for a long time where um, certain people, because of this, their really strong personalities have, have controlled the narrative, controlled trans activism um and it's my impression that it's mostly the agps that have been leading that and and a lot of trans men i've heard over the years feel completely sidelined and have been even told out straight out like we're not really interested in in you being involved in the activism and being involved in these organizations and i mean i've been i've been a part of the gay and lesbian um civil rights movement from the time i was 16 so back in like you know the mostly the 90s and such a difference in terms of how I saw gay and lesbian rights fought for over the years compared to how these AGP women are fighting for, for rights. I mean, it's the AGP trans women, they're not building bridges, right? They're not, they're not fostering relationship they're, they're with other burning bridges. <laughs> Absolutely burning bridges, you know, whereas the gay and lesbian movement, it was all about building bridges, trying to help people understand us better, how to help people so, so trust a, a us big, more. A, a very big difference is that uh, the gay rights, gay and lesbian rights, uh, and, you know, I would say the early trans movements were about Putting forward true ideas, <laughs> whereas uh, you know the, the 
AGP activists who are deny who are saying you know AGP has been discredited and so on. I think that they are about um, uh, hiding ideas and but doing it with the the forcefulness of having been heterosexual men for most of their lives yeah. and then suddenly they're <laughs> right. oppressed and and That's right. they're you know maybe CEOs that are used to bossing people around and are used to people doing what they tell them to and they so they bring that spirit of you know having been heterosexual men who probably didn't experience much discrimination in their lives suddenly being these these champions for a rights movement doing it with very much the characteristics of a heterosexual man who just forces people into submission. Yeah. No, that, that it's, it's quite remarkable. The behavior of the most extreme activists are, are extremely uh, male typical. And I, I, I remember Anne Lawrence, uh, who is uh, a brilliant scholar who is an autogynophilic trans woman uh, she did an analysis of some of my critics, like Lynn Conway, who uh, I believe is autogynophilic and led the attack on me. Uh, there, there's a uh, a uh, an app where you can feed text into the app, and it will diagnose you with pretty good accuracy as being male or female. And she put. Conway stuff in there, and it uh, was very male. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, 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 you know what? Uh, I just do want to make sure that I make the point because uh, I, I am um, very opposed to uh, some of the autogynophilic activists who are in denial. Uh, that I have met, at least on the internet, many autogynophilic individuals who I find quite admirable. You know, autogynophilia is a very strange uh, sexuality. It's hard to, you know, hard to figure out. You know, even, even let, let's say pedophilia, it's you don't want pedophilia, but it's not that hard to figure out. <laughs> Autogynophilia is hard to figure out. And, you know, there are they have all of these pressures toward an understanding that is false, but um, compatible with their innate desires. But uh, many of them, despite those pressures, have. Um, you know, come to the right understanding, and um, I, I just, I, I guess I want to be understood as being not anti autogynophile I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad I didn't have that challenge of being autogynophilic and, uh, but still, uh, it's. One can be autogynophilic and be a great person, and when and if you're autogynophilic, I'm not saying that you should never get a sex change. Maybe you should, uh, but you should do it with your eyes open. Yeah, it's it's kind of remarkable. Um, Aaron and I both obviously have, have lived as trans men, uh, me for a decade, Aaron for a decade and a half, and. Um, I think, Aaron, you only last year learned about what autogynophilia was. Me, I think it was like, like two years ago. But like having been enmeshed in the trans community, so so the majority of, of male to female transitioners, obviously the vast majority are autogynophilic. But even those within the community, the trans umbrella, for the most part, have no idea that that's the case. And I think for a lot of people, for females especially, it, we don't really understand autogynophilia until it's completely spelled out to us because it just doesn't make it doesn't make sense like it, it like whereas i think a lot of men even who aren't autogynophilic kind of intuitively get it um and i think i think that's where a lot of the um the 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 trans rights activists who are, are predominantly 
autogynephilic. That's where the impulse is, is to bury the concept uh, be because because they'll get a lot more sympathy and support um, if it's if it's not understood to be what it is. Well, I'm, I'm not sure it's that much easier for men to understand, except that men understand <laughs> that whatever it is that turns you on, it's not likely to change. It's likely to be a very powerful motivator and so on. Um, yeah, but I, I, I just think autogonna, you know, I've had many years explaining autogynephilia to people and and the most common un, uh, reaction is eyes getting big and saying, "Oh, that's weird," okay. you know, and it's it's weird. Uh, but you know, you know, we're uh, my lab is um, we're studying uh, paraphilias, uh, many different paraphilias, and um, finding a cluster of paraphilias that have things in common with autogynephilia, including things that you might not have expected necessarily. So uh, being a furry, for example, uh, is an internalized sexuality. A lot of these furries, most furries, you know, they have sexual fantasies about themselves as something else. Um, I can sort of wrap my head around the, the concept of, of a target location error. Um, I mean, I can't, it, it's hard to understand like how that can shift and that someone could be attracted to a shoe, you know, rather than, you know, another person. But I think what I have the most difficulty understanding is how a paraphilia can invert. Yeah. I, and I think that that is, uh, that that's where our research is taking us that that particular kind of paraphilia, um, there's the, 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 there are several different kinds that have things in common. Um, whereas, yeah, being attracted maybe not to a shoe, but to a foot, uh, you know, we've, we've done a study of foot fetishes and they're, they're kind of like typical, they're mostly men. All, the, all these groups are mostly men. Uh, and they're they're kind of like uh, typical men, gay or straight, and most of them are straight. They care a lot what that foot is like. They want a female foot. It matters. Uh, and uh, we we did not really find a subset of foot fetishists who imagined being feet, and we looked. <laughs> but but. but uh, yeah so um but but yeah the the ones who invert uh their erotic uh interest i think it's quite fascinating and and i think we actually have some exciting findings that i can't get much into but uh that's that's uh, a lot of how I'm spending my time these days. I look forward to reading that research. It's such a fascinating topic. And I, the one thing I will say is that, uh, you know, we've done uh, one study where we collected a lot of data on both natal males and natal females and uh, our Research suggests that whatever our uh, leads are works only in natal males, not in natal females. So, and, and you know, that's consistent, I guess, with uh, my hypothesis that, you know, there, natal females sometimes look to have some something like paraphilias that occur in males, but I don't think it's been well demonstrated yet, and it might be might it be occurring for other reasons? Um, I think I saw in a in an interview with with James Cantor his um, hypothesis of mirror neurons being potentially um, involved with with AGP. What uh, do you have any sort of thoughts about that hypothesis? 
Um, I, I'm, you know, James is more neuroscience uh, knowledgeable than I am. Uh, though I will say, so mirror, mirror neurons are, were kind of a hot topic a decade or so ago, and I'm not sure uh, that they've really uh, been sustained as as a uh, as a fruitful uh, explanation. You know, if if that were right, that would be cool because that would be a pretty straightforward explanation of uh, these inversion phenomena. Uh, but uh, I will I will wait until somebody who knows uh, what they're doing does the requisite study. Actually, I do have one more thing to add as well. Sure. What do you, what's your familiarity with um, autoandrophilia in males? Because I've heard from um, a few gay men who are basically they understand autogynephilia quite well because they they have they've identified that they are quite autoandrophilic, which is obviously a much more convenient. So I, I, I think. Um, Maybe auto sexuality is fairly common in males. Um, if you're gay, obviously that's a lot easier to deal with than if you're heterosexual. Then obviously that creates the complication that is AGP. Do you have any any? Um, are you are you familiar at all with with autoandrophilia in males? Yeah, I am. Uh, in fact, uh, there has been, uh, to my knowledge, exactly one publication on that. By Ann Lawrence, and I uh, was the one who referred this person to Ann because I met him uh, kind of accidentally. Uh, and th this was a person who um, he, he was very interesting. If you met him, you wouldn't say this is a gay man at all. You know, in fact, you know he. he <laughs> You know, kind of had kind of an awkward straight male uh, vibe going, and his sexuality. Uh, what what did it for him was he would go to uh, like gay bathhouses, would not want to interact with any men. Uh, but he would stand around he would want to stand around with a bunch of men especially guys with attractive bodies and masturbate and imagine that he had their bodies uh he would ima imagine like putting their bodies on himself and that, that's pretty much you know what i would think of uh, that autoandrophilia should be interesting uh, yeah, I think it is. Uh, so I, I think this is one of those other, uh, another um, instance in which uh, I think there's something really promising that hasn't been very well studied. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I'm interested in it being studied more. Perhaps I will at some point. Excellent. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for talking to us today. This has I've, been I've been enjoyed great. it quite a bit. Uh, thank you, and thank you for existing. And uh, you know, we'll I'll be continue to listen to you, and and uh, and I'm sure we'll meet again. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Transparency Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please help out our algorithm by hitting like or subscribe. If you'd like to make a donation, follow the link to our PayPal account. On behalf of the Gender Dysphoria Alliance, thanks for your support.